Um, today, I wanted to come on here and talk about some of the mistakes that people are making with uh, their salary negotiation. Hello, Toya. So go ahead and drop a one in the chat. If you can hear me fine, I just want to make sure that everything is working fine because Instagram is putting up notifications over here saying that it's still sending stuff out. So if you can hear me, drop a one in the chat. Just want to test the delay over here. I don't see any ones yet. So if I'm not seeing the ones, I don't know if you guys are hearing me. So if you can hear me, drop a one in the chat. I got to know that you're here with me so I can get this thing rolling. All right. I see the ones rolling in. Hello on Facebook. Hello on Instagram. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Y'all can hear me. Good, 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 good to go. All right. So anyone who is new here, who is not familiar with my channel, if you do not know, I'm Valerie Page. I'm a registered health information technician, and I've been in the healthcare industry for 16 years now, and I've tripled my salary utilizing the RACA method and the ICAD-PAL method. And this year alone, I've helped other HIM professionals to obtain over $300,000 in salary increases. And a lot of times I get questions all the time about, well, what positions pay the most money? Like, where, how, how do I find these positions? How long do I have to be in the industry? What credentials do I have to have? And I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news or to, to bust it to you like this, but it really doesn't matter what degree you have, what credentials you have, how long you've been in the industry. You really write your own story in terms of what success looks like for you in the healthcare industry. Some people believe that you need to have like a bachelor's degree or a master's degree and have all these different credentials and all these years of experience, but it's just simply not true. And inside of my free masterclass that I did, I showed you guys, I don't know if any of you have attended any of my free um, masterclasses, but inside of it, I actually show you guys my pay stubs. Because when I say to you that you can make a lot of money and that you can scale in your career at a very fast pace in the healthcare industry, if you are strategic and intentional with what you do, I want you to believe that you can really do this at any level. I don't want you to look at me and say, oh, well, you've, you've been in the healthcare industry for 16 years now, and that's the reason why you're making so much money. That's not true. That's not true. Okay. I was making a lot of money early on in my career, making strategic and intentional moves. And I showed you guys my pay stubs so that you can see it. And the, the, I want to call them quantum leaps that I took in my career. You really can make a, a lot more money when you know when to pivot in your career and, and don't become complacent and just stagnant in your career and stay in a position for too long. I made a post the other day where I talked about people staying in their positions for longer than two years, how you get paid less money. And it's true. Unless you are being promoted into different positions, if you're being promoted, then you're probably getting more money if you stay with the same company. But if you're staying at the same company and you're in the same position, your salary is growing at a very slow pace. It's probably growing maybe somewhere between three to four percent a year when it could be grown at a pace of anywhere between 15 to 20 percent if you made a career change to a different company every like two to three years and i just want to put it out there it's like it's nothing personal it's business it's business and you may have seen me uh refer to this sometimes in some in some of my posts but i really want you guys to pay attention to this some people are like you know, I don't, I don't want to be in business. I don't want to be a business owner, you know, business that's not for me. You know, I just rather work for a company. Newsflash. Even if you are working for a company, I don't care. You're still a business. You as an individual, you are a business. Okay. I'm Valerie Page LLC. Okay. Whatever your name is, first name, last name, LLC. You are a business and the business agreement that you get into when you become an employee with a company is your human capital. That is the service that you provide. You are providing a service when you agree to work for a company and the agreement is your human capital, your skills, your expertise, and most importantly, your time. 
This is all valuable. The time that you spent in school, your skills, your expertise, your years of experience, and your time is all valuable. So when you partner in with a company and become an employee with them, you should be compensated fairly or very well. It should never be under underpaying. You should never be underpaid in any position that you're in. I don't care what it is. It either needs to be fair pay or you need to be compensated very well. Okay. And when I say very well, this is for employees who go above and beyond the, the call of duty. Okay. These are the people who, uh, who set the standard, who is the epitome of the whatever position that is in the, in the office. That's you, right? You know your stuff. So if you perform ex exceptionally well in your job, you know your job in and out, you're very good at what it is that you do, then you should be compensated very well. You should not be offered an average salary, okay? So I just wanted to put that out there, get that in your mind that no matter what, like even though you do not have a business, if you don't have a business, you are your business. You are your business and you should be very strategic and intentional with the career moves that you make and the salary negotiation process. And you should not be scared or shy away from that. You should not be scared to ask for the money that it is that you want. OK, and you should be very clear and know exactly what type of money you want. And if you don't know a good place to start in general, forget the job, the job title, forget all of that. Take a moment to sit down and get out an, an, Excel, an Excel spreadsheet and list down everything it is, what your expenses are or what you would like for them to be, right? How much your monthly expenses are with your, your household, your car, your car note, your cell phone bills. If you want to shop, if you want to hang out with your friends, uh, the, the grocery budget, extracurricular activities for your children, all of that. Think of every single thing, getting your hair done, your nails done everything that you can think of list all of these items down and how much you would like to spend a month on these items don't forget your savings because you got to get your savings in there too good 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 friends okay you got to make sure you have money for savings and investments whatever it is that you that you're doing list everything down and calculate that up and, and see what it says that your total monthly expenses what it would look like what your total monthly expenses will look like. And then from there, calculate that by 12, which will be a year. And then add on about, I'd say about 17% on top of whatever number you come up with, with that amount, because you got to add on taxes, you know, because we got to pay Uncle Sam with the federal and state and uh, county taxes, depending on where you live, right? Social Security benefits and all that. Add on a 17% on top of that and then divide that by um, 26 and then by 80. OK, so that you can get the average amount that you would need to be paid hourly in order to live the type of lifestyle that you want to live. OK, Let, let's start there with that, with deciding how much money you need to live the type of life that you want to live. What does that look like for you? And it could be different for each individual person. Someone could probably only want to make 50000 a year. Someone else, maybe 60,000, someone else, 70, 80, 90,000, whatever that may be. But you should know what your minimum, minimum pay is that you need to live the lifestyle that you want to live. Uh-oh, Facebook is doing something over here. The current, mm, I don't know, I might gotta, might gotta X out of Facebook over here. But I'm going to keep it up for right now. It says I have viewers over here. Hey, hey, Facebook. Okay. Hey, Facebook. I'm going to keep y'all up. But if Facebook keep acting funny, then I'm going to have to take you down over here. All right. So are y'all following me? Let me see you drop it in the, ch in, in the chat because we, I want to do a, a mind muscle memory connection here. I want you to write it down in the chat. Say, I am a business. Say, I am a business. Put that in the chat. I am a business. And what I want you to remember is that this is business. It's not personal when you go out here and you look for jobs and someone extends a job offer to you and it's time for the salary negotiation process. Oh, it's game time now. Don't shy away. Don't be afraid to ask for what it is that you want. If you don't feel a little nervous about the number that you put out there when you, when you do, uh, maybe if they ask you what it is that you want or you counter offer, you should feel a little nervous. 
<laughs> you should feel a little nervous with the number that you put out. Like, ooh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what they're going to say, but uh, this, this is my number. Okay, and then from there, that can help you to decide what type of opportunities uh, you, you want to go after in the healthcare industry. And I've said this before, it does not matter what part of the healthcare industry that you work in, you can make a lot of money in this industry no matter where you are. Some people think that uh, you have to work in health IT and the IT side of things. No, that's not the case. You can make a lot of money in the uh, release of information, being a data analyst, revenue integrity. Uh, revenue cycle, coding, medical billing, uh, charge masters. There, there's so, so many different things that you could do in the healthcare industry and in different industries as a health information management professional that can make you a whole lot of money. Okay. And you could do it with just having a credential and you could do it with having an, an associate's degree. Okay. I put this out there all the time because I want people to know, like I have an associate's degree. I have an associate's degree in health information technology and the registered health information technician credential. That is what I have. And I've had, I, I didn't have to add on any additional uh, credentials in order to excel in my career. Do I want to add on additional credentials right now? No, not really. <laughs> I don't I don't think that I need to right now because pretty much anything that I, I want to do, I feel like the, the RHIT credential would uh, hold that weight for me. The R, RHIT credential will do it. Okay? So I, I just wanted to put that out there. Okay, I see y'all dropping it in the chat. I'm a business, I'm a business, I'm a business. Okay? And everybody that's put that down there, when it's time for the salary negotiation process, don't don't shy away and don't be scared to ask for what it is that you want. And I want to tell you this story. <laughs> I want to tell you this story about a, a friend of mine who applied for this position and I was already an employee with this company. And I, I gave her an inside tip and she just was so eager to accept the position because she, she didn't believe that she was going to get it because she had zero experience. Right. I tell people all the time, look, like I can I can. Uh, refer you in maybe you know for a position but at the end of the day you you have to seal the deal with the interview I can't do an interview for you and you're not just going to get a position just based off of my referral you still have to be able to go in and interview well and while the manager or the recruiter whoever is interviewing you you still have to ace that part that's on you so she went and did her thing right and she got the job right and she said to me she said I want to make $18 an hour at this time. This is probably about maybe like 10 years ago, I think. She said, I want to make $18 an hour. I'm like, okay, don't tell them that. I said, one, don't tell them how much money you want to make. Don't tell them how much money you want to make an hour. If they absolutely ask what it is that you want, tell them higher. Give them a, a dollar higher than, than what it is that you want. Tell them $19 an hour, right? So she's like, okay, okay. They called her on the phone and, and offered her a job because I already knew they were going to offer it to her. They called her on the phone, offered her a job, said, how much money is it that you want to make? And she said, well, I want to make like $18 an hour. <laughs> Guess what they offered her when she asked for the $18 an hour? 17 They gave her a dollar less than what it was that she asked for. They gave her an offer of $17 an hour and she took it. And she said the reason why she didn't ask for the 19 was because she was scared. She was scared to ask for the $19 an hour because uh, she didn't believe that, you know, she, she had enough experience to even get the job. She was grateful for them extending the job offer. And she didn't want them to like rescind it back and take it back and say, oh, no, we're going to go with a different candidate. So she said 18 and then they end up, ended up low, lowballing her. And I'm like, you didn't know what they were going to say, what they were going to do. <laughs> you, you, you didn't know. Like you, you lowballed yourself. When a, when a company asks you how much money it is that you want to make, tell them more than the dollar amount <laughs> that you want to make. Don't tell them the exact dollar amount because you don't leave room for negotiation. Okay? The company, yes, I will be saving this for the IGTV replay. And then also housekeeping, housekeeping, housekeeping. Um, if you have any questions, try to save it until the end. Um, because I don't want uh, the questions to roll through and then I don't see it and it's somewhere at the top. I won't see it. Okay. Because I'm just going to try to like talk through this. Okay. All right. So, so yeah, don't, don't tell them how much money it is that you want. 
Don't tell them the exact dollar amount. If they, if they absolutely press it, tell them a higher dollar amount than what it is that you really want. Let me ask you this question. What company do you believe is out here looking for, uh, for a, a candidate, right? And they're like, we're trying to find the best qualified candidate and pay them the most money possible, right? When we find this person, we're going to give them our top ceiling dollar amounts. Do, do you think they're out here doing that? Do you think they're really doing that? Drop a, a one in the chat if you think this is what companies do or two for no. If you know that companies are not out here looking for the best qualified candidate for the positions and saying, and by the way, we want to offer them top dollar. We're going in with our top dollar that we want to offer this person. No, they are not. They are not. Absolutely correct. They are not doing that. They are not doing that. No. They expect for you to negotiate your salary. They, they expect for some form of negotiations to come up. They're not going to go in with their top dollar because that leaves them no room to satisfy whatever your request is. If they go in at their top dollar, <laughs> that leaves them no room to negotiate. Then they really do have to say, okay, no, we're, we're taking the, the, the offer back because, you know, there's... We, can, we can't give you any more money. They're not doing that. And so this is the thing. With, with companies, big companies, HR departments and all that, you know they've already done their due diligence. They already know what the average salary is for the U.S., what the average salary is for the position within their company. They already know what the average salaries are, what their low number is, the mid number is, and what the max number is. They've already did their due diligence. Do you think that they, you know, do the work on the behalf of the employee that's, or the candidate that's applying for the position? Do you think they're like, oh, yeah, by the way, <laughs> let us show you what, what the salary range is for this position. Not, you know, there are some companies that do that, like, you know, on the front end, re they really aren't. The onus is on you to do that, to do that research and to know what the average uh, pay is. It's really on you to do that. So I just, I'm just trying to put some things out there to get the, to get the thoughts going in your head so that you can know that companies aren't going, aren't coming out here with their best top dollar pay rate that they're willing to pay you. They're not doing that. So there is room to negotiate your salary. Do not feel scared or, you know, afraid to negotiate your salary to ask for more money, especially if you did your research and you feel like this could possibly be a low ball offer. Do not be afraid to, to come back and ask for more money. Okay, so um, I, I wanted to put that out there. Uh, so let's get into what you need to do in order to prevent these type of uh, low ball offers from happening. One, first of all, I hope you guys have grabbed the, the free salary resource guide, okay? Because everything that I use to find out what the salaries are out there, it's, it's in there. It's a resource guide, okay? You, Click, click, and the information is right in there. My top five resources, okay? So, mistake number one is not doing your research. Not doing your research and not being prepared. The last thing you want to do is to apply for a position, interview very well, get the job offer, and then freeze up and it's like, I don't know if this is even a fair amount. I don't know if this is the dollar amount that I want to accept. You know, I need to, to go back and, and do some research. You are delaying the process. You're delaying your response because you're going to go in panic mode, right? Trying to look to see what, what the salary amount is or what the average salary amount is for the position. And then you're going to have to go do some research and you're really not going to be able to respond in an expeditious manner. You're not. You're, you're going to have to give them like maybe like a day or two. So if you have done this or if you, you really don't know how to go through the salary research phase, at least send an email immediately saying, thanks for the offer. Give me 24 hours to review this and to get back with you. But you are limiting yourself on your and you're limiting the, the amount of time that you have to gather up enough information and come back with a, a, a different dollar amount if you need to. Okay, so you don't want to do that. Has anyone ever did that? Have you ever got a salary, uh, a job offer, got the salary amount and then like just didn't know if it was fair or not? And you just like, I think this is off. I don't know if I should, should accept it or not. Mm -mm. 
You, you don't want to do that. You want to be proactive versus reactive. You should already know. When you find out that you have this interview and you're preparing yourself for the interview, a part of the preparation process is finding out what the average salary amount is for that position. You should already know what it is that you want to get paid for that position before you even step in there for that interview. So you want to be proactive versus reactive, okay? Proactive versus reactive. The second thing is accepting a job offer too quickly. That's what my friend from before, what I told you about what she did, she, she, she accepted a job offer like that. She didn't even go back on them when they gave her a low ball offer. When she asked for 18 and they gave her 17, she just accepted it because she was, she was too scared. You don't want to do something like that because you got to read in between, you got to read the benefits packages, you guys. Are you just accepting job offers without really going through and reading the benefit packages? If you read the benefit package and you find out that their health insurance plan, right, that they have a, a health insurance plan, let's say Blue Cross Blue Shield, but the, the cost of it is out of this world. So bi-weekly, it's chomping into your take-home pay. You could actually be taking a pay cut if you didn't look to see what the benefits were. You want to look at stuff like PTO, retirement, PTO, a retirement tuition reimbursement. How much money are they giving you for that? Is it really a good deal? You have to look at it full circle. Are you leaving one company that has a, a better tuition reimbursement and PTO policy than, than the new company, right? That could be a deal breaker for you. You don't want to accept the job offer then you look at it and say you only get three days of PTO a year. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to crack up. You don't want to take a job offer. They're like, oh, you only get three days of PTO a year. And you done signed up for it. And you look back like, wait a minute, what? And you done left a job that had six weeks of PTO. That six weeks of PTO might mean something to you. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Has anyone ever accepted? You said you froze. Has anyone ever accepted a job offer and you didn't look at the benefits package? I don't want y'all out there uh, uh, doing that because that, that can actually eat into the take-home pay that you have, okay? Another mistake, mistake number three, one, one number three, settling and not negotiation. Not nego nego negotiating, <laughs> I'm sorry. Not negotiating, just settling for what the company is taking you. Again, that example that I gave my friend before, from before, that is exactly what she did. She accepted the job offer too quickly, and then she just settled. She just took it. You don't want to do that because that is going to slow down how much money you can accumulate and make over time. The less salary that you take and accept on the front end, that's the that decreases the amount of pay increases you get in percentages because usually sometimes it could be anywhere between three, four, five percent that you get annually. The less your salary is in taking the position when you get into the job, the less percentages that you get over the years. Okay. You say, what if you don't have any experience? Do you still negotiate? Yeah. You still can negotiate, especially if you look and you and you did your research and you have determined that this position is a that it's a low ball offer. At the beginning, I'm not sure exactly when you came in, but at the beginning, I said that everyone should at least be paid fairly or very well. If you have years of experience, the credential, um, you know, you, you have all that under your belt, you're a high, top performing employee, you should be paid very well. Those are grounds for asking above average pay. But if you look, you did your research and it's not average pay, it looks like it's a, a low, low ball offer, definitely come back and say that, well, based on my research, this is the number that I came up with and I cannot accept anything below this amount. Okay, mistake number four is revealing too early how much you are willing to accept for a position. Again, with my friend but from before, that what she did also included that error. She she said what it was that she was willing to make. She had put it down on her application and everything. On applications, if, if I can get away with not putting a dollar amount in how much money I'm willing to accept, I will not put it there. I say willing to negotiate. 
<laughs> Willing to negotiate. That is what I have listed. I will not put it there. I don't talk numbers. I especially do not talk numbers until there's an offer. If you disclose too early how much money you are willing to accept, you could be lowballing yourself because you don't know what they were willing to offer. If they ask you that question, especially if they haven't extended an offer yet, I ask them right back, well, how much, what is the pay range? <laughs> well, what is the pay range? It depends. I would, I would ask them so many questions that they would just be like, okay, we just go forget about asking her how much, how much money she's willing to accept. I'm like, what are the, what are the duties? <laughs> I would start asking all other different types of questions until they told me how much money it is that they are willing to pay. And if they don't try to tell you that information, then they're probably trying to get away with lowballing you. They probably want to find out how much money you're willing to accept so that if it is something much lower than they're willing to pay, they'll give you, oh, okay, if you're happy with $25 an hour, okay, cool, we'll give you the $25 an hour because we really was going to offer you 31. You never know. You never know. So because the company is in the position of extending you the job offer and paying you, giving you the money, they're the ones with the money. You have the human capital, which is your services, but they have the money. Let them talk about the money. Let them disclose how much money they are willing to pay for the position. If you can get away with not saying how much money it is that you're willing to accept, get away with it. Okay? Do, do not talk about it. Okay? And then last but not least is... Focusing on, I don't want to say like greed, <laughs> but like just, just solely focusing on the money and not the value that you bring. That is a, mis is a mistake in the salary negotiation process. You don't want to ask for like above average pay just solely based on your knowledge of how much other people are making at the company or average, you know, across the board or what you've seen in a, in a contracted rate amount, that can't be the only basis as to why you're asking for the dollar amount that you are asking for. You really have to sell companies on the value that you bring to the organization. And that's why it is so important for you to know what the common challenges and pain points are for, for companies and for departments. And I'm going to go ahead and, and plug this in here. I talked about this before in one of my lives before. Don't know if you heard it or not. But inside of that live, I talked about finding out what the common challenges and pain points are for the department when you're in an interview. When you are in an interview, that is your chance to find out the exact reason, what the common challenges and different nuances are for that particular department, what that manager is facing. You could look online all day and try to find information about uh, what the common challenges are for a particular department or position, and you will find very generic and basic information. But when you are in the interview and speaking to the manager directly, you can ask that manager directly, what are the common challenges and problems that you are facing? When you get that information, you can use this information in your follow-up, you know, thank you letter to the company, emphasizing how you are the perfect candidate for the position that is going to help them overcome that challenge or problem that they are facing. When you guys see me looking at different ways, that's because I'm on Facebook and Instagram at the same time, okay? You are going to uh, dig deeper into that sore that they talked about what that pain point is, you're gonna dig deeper into that and explain to them that you are the perfect person for that position because you can help them to solve X, Y, and Z. And then when you get into the salary negotiation process, again, you are going to be talking about what value you bring to the organization and the department. You're going to talk about those specific things. Um, I don't know who's on the live right now. I can't see who it is. But inside of my four-week masterclass, I, I dig a little deeper. Anyone who's been following me, you already know the doors to the four-week masterclass is closed. And I'm going to be doing these lives because I want to help you guys out throughout the rest of the year until I open up the doors again. But I want to tell you guys what I tell them inside of the masterclass. I want you to be very intentional and strategic with the things that you do inside of the workplace. Any of your, your wins, your career highlights, your successes, things that you're doing inside of the workplace, I want you to try as much as possible to quantify that information. What, what time are you saving the company? What value are you adding? How much money are you saving them? How much money are you re recovering? You know, are you 
Are you uh, improving a process? Are, are you eliminating the amount of days that it takes to do X, Y, and Z? And what type of financial impact is it having on the company? You want to try as much as possible to quantify this information. Quantify it, quantify it, quantify it, quantify it, quantify it. When you quantify information, it holds more weight. It holds more weight. It holds more weight. Are you getting me on that? <laughs> it holds more weight. Not only when you when you quantify this information, and let me let me back it up. Let me back it up. Because a lot of times we are doing great and wonderful things inside of our positions. Right? And to us, it seems normal and regular because this is what we're doing on a daily basis. And we're leaving information on the table that your manager is going to conveniently forget later on. <laughs> And maybe conveniently forget, or maybe it's just that, you know, they have a lot of employees who they are managing, so they can't keep up with everyone, right? And, so, and sometimes it may not even be on purpose, them forgetting something that you did and what type of financial impact it had on the department, right? It may not even be on purpose that they forgot. But the onus ultimately is up to you to keep up with that type of information. It's not on your manager. It is on you. Let's go back into the your business thing. Let's go back into the business, your business. If you had a business and you were doing wonderful things in your business and then you went to the bank and you said, my business is growing. This is what's going on. These, this is the wonderful things that I'm doing in the community. This is how many people I save. This is the type of financial impact. Da, 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 da. You're going to have to come with, with hardcore facts to get the bank to say, you know what? Your, your, your business really is growing. You are really doing wonderful things. Right. You, you are having a positive impact in the community. You know, we do want to help you grow your business. Right. We are going to give you the money it is that you're asking for to help your business grow. The business that's doing these things in the community, they can't expect for the, the community to go and sing their praises and, you know, keep up with everything that they're doing. OK, you did this on this date. This is how many people you help. This is how much money. It, they, it's not the, the, the consumers that's keeping up with this information. It is the business itself that has to keep up with that type of information so that when it comes to growing their business and going and taking the next step in their business, they have everything documented, everything that they've done. They have everything there. They're not depending on someone else to have all of this information for them. They have the information themselves, the company. You are a company. It is your responsibility to keep up with all of your wins in the workplace. Everything it is that you're doing, I don't care what it is, big or small, make it a big deal. You want to have that information on your resume as a career highlight. And then these will be the things that you would discuss in interviews and why you are a candidate that is above average and why you should be paid and compensated the dollar amount that it is that you're asking for. And if you're strategic and intentional with what you're doing, the type of opportunities that you're going after, then you would be aligning yourself with companies and managers that care about the type of uh, career wins that you've had. They would care about those type of things. I'm, it's very clear for me, I'm just going to use myself as an example. It's very clear that revenue integrity and revenue cycle is what I want to do in my career. I really don't see myself pivoting anywhere outside of this. Okay, and I've been climbing the career ladder in this type of position from, excuse me, revenue cycle manager at the neurosurgery department for revenue integrity specialist for the DC government for not for profit hospitals to revenue integrity coding analyst for a large hospital organization in, in uh, Virginia. Right. And I like to put this out there all the time because people think like, oh, you have to have all these years of experience to, you know, be an inpatient coder to work on the inpatient side of things. Guess how many years of experience I had when I got that position as a revenue integrity coding analyst for the inpatient side of the hospital? Zero years of inpatient coding experience. I leveraged what I had to get what I wanted to get into that position. I leveraged my career wins from before. The money, the time that I saved, the process is improved. That is what I harped on inside of the interview and my, my cover letter, my resume, my thank you follow-up letter to the, to the managers that interviewed me, saying that these things that I did for these companies before is the same thing I could do for your organization as well. And whatever it is that I don't know, I can learn it. 
it's up to me to keep up with my career wins to use that as leverage in salary negotiation. <laughs> the more information that you have on yourself, your, your career wins, the, the detail, keeping up with that type of information, the more quantifiable data that you have on yourself, the better, the better. You want to leverage your career wins to get the money that you want. Okay, inside of the resource guide, I dropped in the website that I use to find all of the government contracts. If you guys did not grab that free resource guide, I don't know what you're waiting on. <laughs> and if you are a member of the free private group, because you have access to the free private group if you grab the resource guide. I'm going to drop the video on how to use that particular website, how to use it. Because um, the, the resource guide is just the links to the websites that I use and why I use them. Now, the government contracted websites, okay, that website shows the contracted rate that the federal government agreed to pay the company that hires individuals for those positions, okay? It is the contracted rate with the government. So keep in mind that the company has to pay the employee, but they also get paid as well. <laughs> so that, that amount, they're not going to offer you 100% or 75% or even 50% of what the government agrees to pay them. It's usually somewhere around like 30, 37%-ish, somewhere in that area. But you have an access to the contract and seeing what these dollars am dollar amounts are and using that information that I gave you and figuring out like, okay, this is probably the highest amount that this company will offer me for this position, right? You knowing what the contracted rates are lets you know where you fall in and what type of dollar amount that you can ask for. Because you know what value you bring, whether you have zero experience or you have a lot of experience, you have a bachelor's degree and an RHIT and a CPC and you are top performer in your position and you know that you deserve above average pay, right? When you go into the salary negotiation, you don't want to say something like, well, your contracted rate with the federal government says $97 an hour and, you know, I, I feel like, you know, I'm an above average employee, so I should at least be offered $60 an hour. No, that's bad business. <laughs> you, you don't want to use your knowledge of what the government contractor rates are as leverage for your salary negotiation process. If you know someone who tells you uh, what their salary is, if someone tells you exactly what their salary is for a company and they still work there and everything, and you're the, even if they don't work there anymore, you don't want to use what someone else told you their salary amount is as leverage. That is not what you want to do. If you find information on Indeed.com, that's one of the resources I have in the guide because Indeed has a whole section with salaries where a uh, um, excuse me, employees go over to that side and they let, they type in how much money they're making with the company. You don't want to use that as leverage. <laughs> you don't want to say, well, you know, I saw 10 different employees in the same position on Indeed in the salary section and said that they make this amount. So this is the reason why. I'm like, no. The information that you find online is to help you to gather up enough information and data to come up with an average dollar amount that an employee should get paid for that position and come up with your dollar amount that you want to be paid, what your, your minimum offer is that you're willing to accept, the average amount and the top dollar that you are willing to accept. And whatever dollar amount you come up with that you want to be paid hourly, ask for a dollar more. I'm gonna tell you what I told my friend because you guys are all my good, good friends. <laughs> whatever dollar amount you come up with, ask for a dollar more. And what's the worst that they can say? No. You know, usually they'll, if you do ask for an amount that um, they cannot go above that, they'll usually come back and say, this is the top amount that we're willing to pay. You know, is this something that you are willing to accept? They'll give you a chance to, you know, to think about it and to accept the offer. Okay. So, you know, I, I just want to put that out there. Do not use um, your knowledge of contracted rates or when someone tells you what their salary is as a leverage in a salary negotiation. You, you are the secret sauce to that. What you bring, the value that you bring to the table. Okay? I had to put, put that out there. Okay? So, 
If you found this information valuable that I gave you so far, just drop any emoji inside of the chat. I have to know if this was information that was valuable for you, okay? Drop it in the chat, drop it in the chat. Drop an emoji in the chat, okay? So remember, you guys, <laughs> number one, research in the beginning. Research, you should know what salary you are willing to accept before before you have the interview not afterwards be proactive versus reactive okay two do not accept a job offer too quickly just thinking that you know the job offer is going to go away so you just hurry up and accept it because like oh my gosh let me just take the job offer like no you're doing them a favor you're making it easy for them remember what i said no company is is going to say oh i'm going in with our top dollar we want to find the best candidate we're going to pay, pay them top dollar we're going to max out our budget. They are not doing that, okay? There is room to negotiate and do not be afraid to negotiate and to, to speak up on your behalf, to take up for yourself, okay? Every now and then, you might find a company that's spot on with a job offer or something that you're willing to take. It's like, okay, they did a good job. I'll take it. I'll take it. But at least do your, do your work first. Do not just blindly accept the job offer without doing your research, okay? Three, Settling and not negotiating. That piggybacks on what I just said. Don't just settle for what they give you. Don't just settle. Negotiate. Don't be afraid to negotiate. Okay? Four, revealing how much you are willing to accept before there's even a job offer. Like, no, don't do that. Don't do that because you're going to lowball yourself because you never know what it is that they were willing to give you. And five, focusing on the dollar amount and not focusing on what value you bring to the organization, to the company. Leverage your skills, your education, whatever credentials you have, your years of experience, your career wins, things that you did in the workplace. Use that as leverage to ask for the average pay, what it should be, or above average pay. If you feel like you go above and beyond the call of duty, you're a top performer in the positions that you worked in, ask for more money. Do not be afraid to ask for more money, okay? So, okay, let's go to questions. Look, I had two. I had, did I have two requests for somebody to join me? Let me see. Are y'all really trying to join me on the live or is, is that on accident? Oh, it disappeared now. Why y'all run away when I click the thing? Because I had two requests to join me on live. Okay, so Q&A. Um, if you did drop any questions before i did not see it because it's rolling around um if you are watching me on facebook i'm going to close this down because the way that facebook is set up it does not give me the option to see the questions um so if you're writing anything on facebook i do not see it at all i'm just double checking to make sure i'm not overlooking it let's go over here Oh, I do see some stuff over here. I guess I could keep you guys up over here. So I'll give it a second. I don't know how long the delay is. If you ask me a question, if you see the box at the bottom, it has like a circle, it looks like a, a message icon and it has a question mark inside of it. Use that so that it um, does not get lost. Um, other than that, I will try to read down here. You said, you said um, Pat, you said, how accurate are the pay ranges on Glassdoor? So, <laughs> unless people are just going on there just outright lying, you know, it, it could possibly be a little inaccurate. But I'd like to think that people are not going on there lying about how much money it is that they are making. What I will say about using websites like Glassdoor and Salary.com is that you want to look at salary information that is fairly recent. I would say within the past... 12 months. You don't want to look at a salary range that someone posted for a position you're interested in that was from five years ago. The cost of living has changed, times has changed, the, the value to the dollar, all of that has changed. Um, so I would not use information that is from a long time ago. So essentially you will want to go into these websites, look up the salary ranges for the position that you are interested in, the preferably the company, the exact company, if you can get the exact company, and Hope and pray that there are at least 10 different salaries listed so that you can come up with an average 
for that um, particular position. You may have to use several different websites in order to gather that information if all of it is not listed on Glassdoor.com. Um, and then I also wanted to do like a kind of like a not like a shout out, but I highly recommend for anyone, whatever position it is that you're in right now, doesn't matter what that position is. To go on Indeed.com and in your profile, put down how much money it is that you're making in your position. It helps Indeed to put the to get the average salary across the U.S. and then also for the for the company and the position. It helps them to gather more information when we go in there and we share our own salary. So we're kind of we're kind of creating the salary transparency that companies are not creating on their websites. I really wish it was a standard that companies would just do that. It's like, save us all the time. Just just put what the salary range is so that we can decide whether or not we want to apply for this position or not, for goodness sake. But not all companies do that. So in the meantime, in between time, the best thing that we can do just as um, you know, employees out there in the workforce is working is go on Indeed.com and put down how much money we're making in our position with the companies that we're working on, that we're working with, so that when other people go and they do the salary research, they're doing their salary research process, that they have some good information. And uh, it's not like Indeed puts it out there. It's not going to say, oh, Valerie says she makes this much money at this company. That's not what they do. You know, this is information that they use to create the data that we use to uh, research salaries. So I encourage anyone to go on Indeed.com and in your profile, put down how much money you're making. It's going to help somebody else out that's going to go and look to see whether or not they want to interview for a position and what type of money people are making in the, in the position. So go and, go and put that information in there. Um, it's only going to help us out. <laughs> it helps the companies out when we don't openly discuss the amount of money that we're making in the, in the position. It's only helping them out when we don't talk about it. All right. Sassy Kira, you said, do you think organizations lowball if you transfer within? Um, no, I don't think that companies lowball when you transfer within. Companies actually prefer to keep their employees. It actually saves them money when employees transfer from within to different departments. It costs companies more money when they have to acquire new employees or there's high turnover rates and employees are leaving and have to go through the training process and all that stuff again. It costs companies more money to hire in new employees. So companies actually like to hire within, especially like hospitals. They love that. They really love to hire within. Um, and no, no, I don't, I don't think that it's, it's a low ball. And even still, you know, if you transfer within and you think it's a low ball offer, negotiate is not, is nothing personal. It's business. Don't be afraid to negotiate your salary. If you get an offer and it's not something that you want, negotiate that thing. Sad security said, I feel they do when you transfer within. So is it something like a lateral move? You know, if you are transferring from like one department to another department and it's in the same position or a position that's very similar, it could be possible that it's not um, a lot of money that they're off. Excuse me, a lot of um, money that they're offering you. More money. But if it is a, a promotion, then it should be a significant increase. It, sh it should be. Um, they do have access to your your pay rate your current pay rate so that whole part where i talk about like not letting them know you know how much money you're getting paid and what you're willing to accept they do have that information but still at the end of the day you have the power to say yes or no you still can do the the research you still can do the research and find out what the average pay is and if it's low ball from the average pay then ask for more money and if you feel like you are an above average pool employee and the amount that they're offering you is average and you want more money ask for more money the worst thing that they could tell you is no right and same thing vice versa you have the power to say no to them as well they cannot force a job on you and if that's what you're seeing that's happening and you're applying within and you're seeing that the, the offers are low ball then it's time to start looking somewhere else Uh, Teresa, you say, how can a certified coder become a revenue integrity analyst? Um, what I would tell you to do is to leverage the experience you have. So whatever type of coding it is that you are doing, I would start looking for analyst positions 
in that particular area. So if you are, let's say you do ED coding for the emergency department, I would start looking for revenue integrity coding analyst positions specifically for the emergency department because you have a different set of skills that are unique to you that you can that you can leverage. You would be like a more attractive employee to um, a, a HR representative or the manager for that particular position. So let's just put you and I against one another, right? Let's just say you do have ED coding experience and you apply for that position. And I apply for the position as well, but I don't have ED experience. You would be able to leverage all of your, your experience, your skill set to get into that position quicker than I can, even though I'm already a revenue integrity coding analyst, you would be the more attractive candidate for the position. It is all about being strategic and intentional with your approach, with your job search. Leverage what it is that you have to get into the positions that it is that you want. If you're ready to take that leap right now, you can take that, you can take that leap right now. Be strategic, be intentional. So whatever type of coding it is that you do, look for revenue integrity analyst positions specifically in that area. That's what I want you to do. Pat, you said, what if you come from a high paying market like New York and worked in New York for years and have salary base from New York and moved to a lower paying market state? How can you negotiate to maintain the higher salary? Pat, are you saying that if you move somewhere else, are you saying that if you move somewhere else to a, a different state where the pay is lower and you look for pay, I mean, look for a job inside of that state also to still get the salary amount from New York? I think that's what you're saying. If that is what you're saying, it's going to be a bit of a challenge. I'm not going to say that it's not possible, but it's going to be a bit of a challenge. I do not seek out opportunities in states where the cost of living is low and the pay, pay rates are low. I just don't. You know, that's, that's the way I kind of curve ball that. I've lived in two states so far outside of the state that I work for. My job is in Virginia. And I've, I've never had to experience a pay cut. There was someone in the Facebook group the other week, I had posted something about a position in California that was paying significantly well for an inpatient code of position. It was something like $50 an hour. And they're like, oh, cost of living. And you know, they, they shave off for that. And I'm just like, where do they do that at? Cause I don't, I don't, I don't know about that. I have heard talks about um, some companies realizing that remote employees are doing that, that they are working for companies that are in top paying states, but living in states where the cost of living is low. And some companies were saying things like, oh, well, maybe we need to adjust the pay that we're paying people that are in different states. Now, I haven't caught wind of this actually happening, but I know if your girl get that type of information, I'm going to talk about it on my page. But I, I have not seen that type of information before. My The company I work for is in Virginia. I've lived in Texas and I also I live in Arizona right now. My pay has not changed. The cost of living in Texas and Arizona is significantly lower than what the cost of living is in Virginia. And I get paid very well. And I, there's been no adjustment in my pay. So what I would recommend is, I mean, you can look to see if there are any opportunities out there. You never know what, you, what you're going to come across. But if you're looking for opportunities that are paying you like New York is paying you and it's just not happening, then the move might have to be that you just work for companies that are in top paying states and, you know, work remotely. I don't know if you don't want to work remotely, but why not? <laughs> I don't know if that's the case. <laughs> okay, hold on, let me go back. Okay, hold on, let me look over here at Facebook. I don't want to neglect y'all. Uh, Shania on Facebook, you said, do I have a private Facebook group to join? Yes, I do. I do. If you grab the free resource guide that I have for um, salary negotiation, how to prevent lowball offers, there is a link inside of that resource that you click and you can just answer the three questions to get inside of the group and you will be in the group. That is all you got to do. Um, Karen, you said, where are the resources that you mentioned? Karen on Facebook. If when you get off the live on my page, if you go to the link where it says my website is, click on my website, that very first link, there's something blinking at the top and it says free resource guide for salaries. 
click on that. That is the resource guide. Uh, Nora, you said, what salary negotiation advice do you have for students that have no experience or completed education? I'm glad you asked me that, Nora. Let's get into it. So one of my students, Nina, I don't know if she's on here listening. She's one of my favorite success stories. Nina had just finished her program. She had just finished her program for associate's degree. Okay. She did not have experience. <laughs> she did not have experience. And when she enrolled inside of my master class, she said, I want to work for the government. She said, I want to work for the government. She told me what position it is that she wanted to get. I said, well, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's come up with your strategy, what your, career, what your game plan is. She hit the ground running. She got the position with the government and she, she hit me up and she said, they offered me this amount of money. It's more money, but should I accept it? I helped her out with the research process. I said, they actually are pretty spot on. They actually offered you a good amount of money. She said, I want more. I said, well, okay. Well, ask for more. <laughs> she went back and she asked for more money. She did her research. She did her research stuff. She asked for more money. They gave it to her. They gave it to her. And then after that, guess what she did after that, y'all? There's the, the ICAD PAL method that I teach inside of my master class is the method and the framework that I use to add value in my positions that I work in, to add career highlights onto my resume, and to ask for the amount of money that I want when I get job offers and I do my salary negotiation. It's things that I do intentionally. She was in that job about, I want to say maybe about six or eight weeks. So she spotted something out and she said, oh, okay. She spotted something out. I'm not going to call out exactly what it was, but she spotted it out and presented it to management. And she got another four or $5,000 on top of the salary that they gave her when she started. It wasn't even a, a, I don't even think she made it to her 90 day evaluation yet before she got more money. <laughs> she hit the ground running. I'm using her as an example to say, don't be afraid to negotiate your salary at any point. Your human capital, what I talked about in the beginning, that is your business. The business that you have, the service that you provide is your human capital. You put a dollar amount on what you decide what that is at what level. Be fair about it, just like you want companies to be fair about it as well. Your education, how much you spent on it, how many years of experience you have, what credential you have, do your research, and come up with a dollar amount of what you think is fair. So that means don't go online and do research and see that a position that the average amount is 52000 but you're going to ask it for 75000 and that's not right. <laughs> right? Be realistic. Be, be, be realistic and fair. Right? If you want more money, work on your plan to climb the career ladder. That's fine. Work on your plan to climb the career ladder. It can happen. You can do it. You, you're not going to be stuck at one spot, but for so long. So I, I say all that to say, I don't care where you are in the process. If you're a fresh graduate, do your research, find out what the average salary is, get paid what it is that you want. If you live in an area where the cost of living is low and the pay is also low, you might want to consider working remotely for companies that are in top paying states. If you don't know what the top paying states are, I have that inside of my job search strategy masterclass, okay? Everything that I teach is inside of my masterclasses, all right? So don't, don't be afraid to negotiate your salary at any point. So the modesty corner, you said, what salary negotiation advice do you have for students seeking employment with no experience to use as leverage? So it's kind of like what Nora said over here. So I hope that um, that answers your question. It's, it's, the, it's the same thing, pretty much, what she just said. Shania on Facebook, you said, how much higher should you ask if you know the salary range? If you are an above average employee, I'd say ask for like the top 75 percent percentile of that salary range that you're looking at the top 75 percent so if you're an average employee that's in the you know 
the 50 to, I say 50 to, to you know, 65% range. If you're above average employee, when you get the salary range, you need to be asking that 65% and above. Now, companies, they're not going to give you like the, the, the top, top, top dollar. Because if you are within a salary grade, they usually have like a pay grade. There has to be room for them to do your performance evaluations and for them to give you a percentage increase annually each year. If you at the top bracket, then it's, it's going to kind of be like, okay, we don't have no room to give you pay raises over the next couple of years because you you already getting paid top dollar. So you don't you don't want to be too too high up there, but as for the top pay range, <laughs> Tiffany said that's not realistic. Three days of PTO. <laughs> Don't ask for, I mean, don't accept a, uh, a salary or a job. And then you look at the benefit package because you just skipped over that. You know, you look at the benefit package and they like three days of PTO. Uh, Tiffany, she said, what about government jobs that have a set salary? I know you have resources. Where are the resources that you were referring to minutes ago? Yeah, so it's, I believe it's resource number three in the guide. And Tiffany, you have access to the um, video that I did inside of the masterclass where I give a step-by-step -step demonstration on how to navigate that website to find the contracts. Everyone um, who is inside of the private group, I'm going to drop that in there for you guys as well because I know it can be a bit of a process to get through that website. And it's good to have the, the visual demonstration of how to navigate it. So I am going to drop that inside of the free group tonight for you guys anyone um, who has the resource so that you can see how to use that and remember what i said to you guys my disclaimer and i even wrote it down uh inside of the resource guide the information that you find on this website the contracted rates should not be used as leverage in a salary negotiation that is for your information to have don't be up in there like well i see you getting this much money from the government this is why I'm asking for this much money. What? No. Mm -mm, don't do that. Please do not. <laughs> I'm a business. I love that. Okay. I love it. I love it. If you guys were not thinking that before, like, I, I hope, I hope you understand, like you're grasping what I'm saying to you when I say that you, you are a business, you are operating and functioning as a business in the United States of America, whether you want to accept it or not. When you was born and you got that birth certificate and you got your social security number, we, we all became products at that point. We're all products We're working in this system. And really, America is really set up as a business and in favor for businesses, honestly, if we want to be honest. So it's time to start operating like one. Start think, start thinking like one. There's some people, honestly, who get these credentials that actually do go and um, create an LLC in their name. You can. Anybody can create a business. <laughs> who, who's gonna Who's gonna stop you? You really can do that. <laughs> you really can do that. Remember, the service that you are providing is your human capital. Your skills, your education, your years of experience, and most importantly, your time. And with that alone, if you if you were scared or nervous or didn't feel comfortable with the salary negotiation process before, if you ever felt like that before, I hope now you feel like, no, absolutely not. I spent my years and time in school studying, getting this degree, getting this credential, and you want me to come work for your company? I have to leave my family for eight hours a day. Probably have to commute for two, three, four hours a day. I have to leave my family behind to, to come and work. You know, th th this is valuable. Our time is valuable. Time is more valuable than money, right? So with that alone, you should be like, no, I'm not going to be shy or scared or nervous to negotiate my salary or to ask for what it is that I deserve. Not after I just spent thousands of dollars on school, hours and hours in school, hours and hours studying for this exam. I'm about to come in here and work for this company and do things that's going to make you more money. And you're going to lowball me? I think not. Not on my watch. It's not going to happen to you guys on my watch. Because I'm going to give you the keys. <laughs> we said.
Is that called a Tashana? What are you saying? You say is that called a locality pay scale? I think that's what they were talking about when they were saying that um that they were gonna try to do it like that. But I don't I don't know how you know how accurate that information is. I gotta do a bit more research on that. So I'll get back to y'all on that. You said TT, you said, do you think getting a CPC is a good start for a new grad to get my foot in the door? I currently will be getting my BS in health administration. Yes, any any credential really is good to get your foot in the door. Do you already have uh, any credentials or any degrees or any experience, anything at all? But yes, absolutely. CPC is awesome. Monique, you said go girl. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. I know Teresa probably like, oh my gosh, she remember me? You guys, like, do y'all be surprised when I be talking to y'all in the DMs? Y'all, don't be afraid to talk to me. I be in there talking like I don't know what. People be like, oh my gosh, she actually be talking. Like, and I don't be texting y'all. I be in there video, uh, not video chatting, but uh, sending y'all voice messages. <laughs> you said, do you recommend working for a healthcare insurance company? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I do. <laughs> there, there, there really isn't any company that I would say not to work for. There, there really isn't one that I would say not to work for. Say no way, OMG. Health insurance companies is an awesome choice. What I would tell you guys, what I like to do. <laughs> so what I like to do when it comes to companies, like if I'm looking at a particular company, I like to work for large organizations. And that's just me personally, because I just, I've been through some traumatic experiences working for small, small companies. I got a lot of, a lot of experience working for small companies, but I, I really don't prefer it. And the reason being is because it, it just was like, it wasn't stable. There was a lot of changes. Like the policies would change like one month we doing this and next month we doing that. And people just changing things conveniently just based off of what I, like, I don't know. It just, it, 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 it wasn't stable. It was a state one. I just I couldn't do it. And things like that bother me with my personality type. I'm an ISTJ and I'm, I'm very systematic, process oriented and things that change constantly bothers me. And um, <laughs> after working for small organizations, I said I, I would only work for large organizations like I just cannot do it. So I, I intentionally look for large organizations like in a particular area. So you said health insurance companies. So what I would do, depending on if you want to work remotely or if you want to work in a particular state, I would look at the, the top health insurance companies, right? And just off the top of my mind, you know, that's companies like um, Medicare, because CMS, don't forget CMS, y'all. Don't forget CMS, Centers, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. They have a lot of opportunities. Uh, it's a health insurance company. <laughs> don't forget about them. Right. So Medicare and Medicaid, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Aetna, Cigna. I would be looking for opportunities with these companies and I would see if they had anything local and I would look to see what type of remote opportunities that they have. That's what I would do. You said, what is the discount code is 50. So five zero and off OFF 50 off. And that's going on until midnight tonight. Um, I'm in uh, Arizona, so it is 7.32 my time. It's not midnight here, so I don't know where you guys are. Um, what is it, 7, 8, 9, 10? I know on the East Coast, it's like 10.30. Um, so you guys still got some time. You got about three, four hours. It is 50% off. Um, I want to help you guys out as much as possible. I did close down the doors to the four-week masterclass because I want to um, continue helping the members who are still in there who have not found jobs yet. I want to help them out. And I'm also in the process of revamping that masterclass. And when it comes back, it's going to be bigger, it's going to be better, and it's also going to cost more. Um, throughout the months, I, I kept giving like different chances for everyone um, to get a chance to get inside of the masterclass. Um, some people fell in. I think uh, maybe about 50 people or so got inside of the masterclass altogether. The fourth one with coaching, you get that one-on-one -on -one support from me. 
Um, but the doors to that is now closed. And I do know there's so many of you that are still looking for jobs and I still want to help you guys out. So I still have my resume um, templates. Those are still on my website. The resume masterclass is still on there as well as the job search strategy masterclass is in there. All of my techniques and strategies, everything that I use are embedded inside of those masterclasses. So grab them while they hot, yo. Grab them while they hot. <laughs> um... You said, can you discuss negotiation negotiations, a sign-on bonus when you are in the high percentile range? I need more details. Can you discuss negotiations as, as a sign-on bonus? Are you saying a sign-on bonus that wasn't presented? Like you're asking for a sign-on bonus even though they didn't talk about it? Like, I need more details. T, say no experience yet? No worries. Don't, don't. Don't let not having experience deter you from applying for any positions or negotiating your salary. As long as you know what, the, what that average range is, okay? Like I said, don't don't do your research to see that the average range is fifty two thousand for that for that position, and then you just in there asking for eighty thousand. That now I ain't, I ain't tell y'all to be de, be delusional or nothing. Okay, don't say Valerie said Valerie didn't say that. <laughs> just if, if you don't have any experience right let's okay let's say you have no experience you have no experience and you don't have anything that you can leverage at the moment right you don't have any career highlights or anything like that yet and uh, you apply for a position and let's say the average pay range based off your research is $25 an hour but they offered you 20 do not be afraid to ask for that 25. Also, do not be afraid to walk away from low ball job offers, especially if you really, really know it's a low ball job offer. Because what you're going to do at the end, you're ultimately going to end up hating your job and resenting it and not feeling like you even want to be there. Because you're going to feel like you're not being paid what it is that you're that you're supposed to be getting paid. So eventually, you're going to end up not liking the job, and you're going to like you're, you're going to be working on your way out. Okay, so don't don't be afraid to ask for what it is that you deserve. Like you, you shouldn't have to accept the low ball offer just because you don't have experience. You don't have to do that. Okay, and that's why I use Nina as as an as an example. You know, some people think that they can't even get into the government because they don't have experience. That's not the case. Nina did not have the experience. She was a recent graduate. She got the government position. They gave her a job offer. She asked for more money. They gave her more money. And when she got in there, she used my ICAP Power framework to identify something that was going on in the office and opportunity. She jumped at it, right? I, I, I like to teach people to be, be proactive instead of reactive and intentionally look for things. Okay, let me tell you that. And intentionally, look, intentionally look for things that are going on inside of your workplace where you can help to solve that problem. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I didn't scale in my career by being afraid to step to the plate or to, to, to step outside of my box and do things outside of my position. I was never afraid to do that. It has been a part of my success. I have never been the type of person that said, that's not my job, I'm not doing that. Or I'm not gonna do that, that's just too much work, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I've never, never, never did that. And I don't tell anyone else to do that. I know some people are like that. It's like, hey, do you? You know, but don't be complaining about why somebody else getting paid more money to you because you want to do the bad minimum. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, Lana, you say, yes, I'm leaving a small company. It's just too much. I'm trying to fix the processes. Uh-huh. In the processes that you fix, make sure that you um you gather all that information. And whether you're improving the, uh, the the amount the amount of time it takes to co to complete that process, or you help it to recover money, whatever information that is, get all the quant quantifiable data, okay, before you you part from that position. Make sure you get all that information on your resume. Less stressing, you're okay with that? Awesome. You want to work for CMS? There's a lot of opportunities. He said, "So proud of thank you." <laughs> Asking for what? All right, let's see. Is somebody? Wait, is now I see two? Is somebody trying to go live with me? Is someone? Does someone want to go live with me? Okay, let's see. 
Now I think I think I'm done with the questions on this side. Uh, Nora said most jobs I see don't list anything about salary. I know I hate that. And you said, is this discussed after the interview? Yes, yeah, some companies just wait until the um, offer stage to discuss salary. Some won't even tell you at the interview what the salary range is. Unfortunately, I, I really, really wish that this is something that they would change, that companies would just start disclosing that information, you know, in the, in the job posting. Just tell us, okay, so we could decide whether or not we want to apply for the job or not, for goodness sake, just tell us. But they don't. And that's why earlier I recommended like, hey, if you have not gone on Indeed.com yet and in your profile, put how much money you make in your position and what company you work for, please do that. I mean, it helps us all out. Indeed does not put it out there. They don't they don't put your information out there about, you know, uh, what company you work for and how much money you said. It helps them to gather the data and to present that information to people going online researching salary information. It, it helps Indeed to give us more accurate information. All right. Remember, if you have not grabbed the free resource guide, it is in my bio, whether you're on Facebook or um, or on um, Instagram, go in my bio. It's the first item. It is completely free. It is a resource guide. It is the resources that I use to do salary research, okay? Also in there is the link to join the free private Facebook group. If you wanna join the group, click the link, answer the three questions, and you will be in the group. Also, if you want to get on the wait list, if you want to get on the wait list for the HIM Blueprint for Success Masterclass when it reopens in January 22, there's also a link in there if you want to get on the wait list. Everyone will not be able to get inside of that masterclass, okay? It takes a lot of time, energy, and effort for me, and I do work with the individuals inside of that masterclass very closely okay we meet weekly on a zoom we're inside of the facebook group they email me message me all of that <laughs> and i work with you all the way throughout the process until you find a job so um because of that it is not something that everyone gets inside of but if you do want to get inside of that master class when it opens up in january then you do want to be on that list so that you could be notified when the doors open for that again Okay, other than that, I do not think I have any more questions over here. I don't see any more questions on Facebook. So if that be the means said, have a good night, you guys. And remember that you are a business. You are valuable. You deserve to be paid your worth. You put in a lot of time and energy in school and getting your education and getting whatever credential it is that you have. Time and energy, your time is valuable your time is valuable and you do not deserve to receive any type of lowball offers whatsoever you should be compensated fairly or you should be compensated very well for the work that you provide 